idea is that so far we have it's been quite theoretical in many ways and it may not be very obvious how this is all done how this is all practiced uh, and uh, what i want to do now is i want to kind of bring it back to reality how do we actually practice how do we actually do these things in practice uh, sorry yeah okay now not sleeping anymore yeah Okay, laptop awake. Okay, are you as everyone as awake as the laptop? That's the question here. <coughs> so uh, I want to kind of bring it all uh, together, how to do this in practice, how to make this work. And uh, to do that, I'm going to have a look at the Anapana Sati Sutta, which kind of uh, shows us in practice how, how these things are actually done. Because if you look at this chitta contemplation that we just had a look at now, and we have uh, uh, also, maybe we didn't actually look at the Vedana contemplation, the contemplation of feeling here, but if you look at them, it doesn't really give any context. It just says that you know the mind, uh, such, such and such a kind of mind, and you know this particular type of mind. Uh, but it doesn't give you any clarity about how you actually know these things. Uh, so it's quite uh, difficult to put into effect and in how you actually practice this. And this is why if you go around the Buddhist world, there's a large number of different interpretations how to do this. Uh, yeah, People have different ideas about just watching the mind in daily life and watching the feelings in the body and all of these kind of things. Uh, and for this reason, it's very useful when you come to the Anapanasati Sutta and the Buddha says that the way to do this uh, is by watching the breath. And as you watch the breath, uh, all of these things, it becomes very clear how this is to be practiced. Uh, so let's go to the uh, Anapanasati Sutta. Here it is, I think. Yeah. Okay, let's just get rid of the Pali because it just gets too much on the screen. Is that okay? Am I allowed to do that? Uh, or is that bad karma to get rid of the Pali? Uh, <laughs> so... Uh, Okay, so this is the first kind of interesting paragraph here uh, on from the Anapanasati Sutta, the Sutta on uh, mindfulness of in and out breathing, quite literally here. And uh, this is what it says here at the beginning of how the breath meditation is supposed to be done. Uh. Mendicants, when mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated, uh, it is of, it is very fruitful and beneficial. Uh, it's a good start, isn't it? Uh, mindfulness of breathing, when cultivated and developed, uh, fulfills the four kinds of mindfulness meditation. Uh, the four kinds of mindfulness meditation, when developed and cultivated, fulfill the seven awakening factors. Uh, and the seven awakening factors, when developed and cultivated, fulfill knowledge and freedom. Uh, so this is kind of the critical little part here. Uh, and this is what shows you that really uh, meditation in Buddhism is really all about watching the breath. And if you do watch the breath, uh, it's all you have to do. All the four satipatthanas that we have just been looking at, including the citta, nupassana, contemplation of mind and feelings, uh, it may not seem obvious what that has to do with mindfulness of breathing, but actually it is all completed by mindfulness of breathing here. Yeah, so this kind of tells you then the context in which you actually do these exercises of Satipatthana practice. Uh, it goes via the breath, and as you uh, watch the breath, you also become aware of feelings and the mind at the same time. Uh, and then as you do the four mindfulness meditations in this way, that fulfills the seven awakening factors, uh, and then that leads to knowledge and freedom, knowledge and liberation. Uh, yeah, which is the end of the path, which is arahantship and everything else. Uh, so this is what the mindfulness of breathing does. Uh. So I think, this is just my feeling about this, but you know, when you read about all the various kind of meditation techniques that are available around the world, uh, if you come back to the word of the Buddha, this is how it is done. Uh. Yeah, just watching the breath, it makes it so simple. Uh. And I think that rather than inventing 
the wheel afresh, and you probably the wheel isn't even a very good wheel. If you've got a good wheel already, why invent another dodgy one? Uh, the best wheel was invented by the Buddha. So stick with the Buddha's wheel instead of going on to another wheel. That's what I reckon. Uh, so uh, if the Buddha says that mindfulness of breathing takes you all the way to awakening, uh, then just stick with that. Uh, commit to it. Uh, practice it again and again. Find out how it is actually done. Uh, and as you do that, and sometimes you have to commit to things quite strictly and, and uh, keep on doing it for a long time uh, in order to actually reap the benefit of something. Uh, if you are too quick in moving around from one thing to another one, you don't reap the benefits of that commitment uh, and perseverance with one practice, the practice that the Buddha himself recommends. Uh. So what, how does this work then if it is so powerful? And this is uh, what the Buddha has to say and how is mindfulness of breathing developed and cultivated to be very fruitful and beneficial. Uh, it's when a mendicant has gone to a wilderness, to the root of a tree or to an empty hut. They sit down cross-legged and uh, with their body straight and establish m mindfulness right there. Just mindful, they breathe in. Mindful, they breathe out. Uh, so here again you have this idea that we saw before, gone to the wilderness, to the root of a tree or an empty hut. Uh, if you remember from the gradual training, it talked about the abandoning of the five hindrances uh, and it starts off with a line which is quite similar to this one, except there it also had things like uh, gone to a ravine or to a forest and, and these kind of things, but uh, it's a very similar kind of line. So you know that now you're dealing with meditation practice. Yeah, to an empty hut. This is kind of nice. So it's good to have an empty hut. Have you got an empty hut? <laughs> That's, this is why you become a monk, yeah, or nun, because you get an empty hut. They said, here is your empty hut. Okay, now it's no longer empty because I'm here. But one person, that's good enough, yeah? It's empty except for you. Huh? So uh, this is the nice thing about monastic life. If you have ever been to a monastery in Perth, some of you have, uh, and you will know what it's like. You get a, f uh, you know, far away in the forest, you get a little hut, uh, and you, you're told, okay, here, this is your place. Uh, small little place. Uh, my hut, what is it, seven square meters? Uh, yeah, it's kind of tiny, even by, even by Hong Kong standards, when they have these <laughs> tiny things. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> still, it's tiny. Uh, and uh, it's wonderful. I, one of the things, that after a while, you don't want to have anything larger than seven square meters. Uh, easy to clean, yeah? <laughs> you can't have too many belongings in there because it gets crowded really, really quickly. So you have to chuck things out all the time, uh, which is great. Uh, but what is the best thing about it is that uh, instead of having a large amount of kind of, uh, you know, real estate in terms of uh, uh, buildings, uh, you have the land, you have the freedom, you have the being in nature. When I am in my hut, I can't see anyone else. Uh, I'm kind of far away. All I can see is kangaroos and spiders, and, and some of them are not f so friendly, th some of those spiders. But anyway, they, they, you know, they don't really bother you if you don't bother them. Uh. So that is what really matters. Uh. You have a tiny place, but you have a lot of land around. Uh. That is the good thing about the monastic life. And sometimes I drive into the city in Perth, uh, when you go into the city, uh, there are lots of big mansions in Perth. Uh, lots of really, some of the wealthiest people in Australia that live in Perth. Uh, and have these enormous mansions. Uh, but because the real estate is so expensive, it's only half a meter to the neighbor. Uh, yeah, the neighbor is next door. Uh, and because it is so close, uh, you have a kind of psychological feeling of being, you know, being oppressed a little bit. Uh, you don't have this feeling of expansion, of being by yourself, of being... Uh, and it leads to a psychological sense of freedom when there's no one around. You feel kind of free. Yeah, it is strange how that is, but in actually feeling of being secluded, being away, it leads to a kind of freedom that we can never actually have in the city in quite the same way. Uh, I've seen some of the big houses here in, in Singapore as well, uh, and uh, it's not the same. I'd much rather have a little cutie in the forest than having some of those big houses right here in Singapore. Uh, do you agree with that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> wow, you're really you're you're, <laughs> you're very smart. You're very very wise. That's really that's really good. Huh? Okay, so you go to an empty hut. Yeah, not to a crowded house, but an empty hut, um, and then you sit down. Meditation practice, real meditation practice, happens when you sit down, 
and this is one of the reasons that uh, you know when you look at the four postures and you look at the uh, the uh, sati the sampajanya aspect of the uh, Satipatthana Sutta doesn't really fit in because these are things that are done when you move around. But that's not meditation. That is just the prerequisites for meditation. Real meditation, watching the breath, happens when you sit down. You put your body straight. Yeah, it's because you have a bit more mindfulness when your body is straight, but don't put your body straight too quickly. Start off like this if you have to. <laughs> And if you start off like this in a while, I'm not sure how to talk in a microphone and do this at the same time, it's kind of hard. But if you do this in the right way, uh, you wake up uh, and then after a while, bang, wow, it worked. And now I'm not tired anymore. And this is okay. Yeah? So start, don't force yourself. Whatever you happens in meditation, if it is natural to fall asleep, follow the natural path, uh, the path of little resistance. If there's too much resistance and too much hardship, you're not going to be able to fulfill this path in the long run. You've got to enjoy the spiritual path. It's the only way it's going to really work out in the long run. Uh. So you put your body straight. Eventually, when you are ready for it, at the right time, establish mindfulness right there. In other words, here, in the present moment, in the present space. Yeah, Here. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to feel the tip of your nose. Uh or the upper lip or whatever, this is kind of a standard uh, interpretation of this. The Pali is satting parimukkang upatapetva. Upatapetva means established, sati is mindfulness, and parimukkang is one of these words that has been written large tracts about uh, to decide what it means. But it seems to mean something like right here, in the present space, in the present time. It doesn't necessarily mean, I don't think it means the tip of the nose or anything like that. Uh, so just uh, go with uh, the uh, easy, go, go with what seems natural. And uh, Ajahn Brahm, he always taught me from, wha from when I started my monastic career to just be aware of whether the breath is going in and out. That's good enough. Uh, yeah, so be aware of that. Where it goes in and out, that's body contemplation, not breath contemplation. And uh, Ajahn Brahm is very good with this kind of uh, uh, breath meditation, so I, I trust his judgment on that one. In, in the end, it doesn't matter so much. If it works for you, you can do it, and you can watch it wherever you, you like, really. Yeah. Then it says, just mindful, you breathe in. Mindful, you breathe out. Uh, and uh, it is interesting there, the little word just, uh, satting eva. Sati eva means, eva means just. Uh, yeah, it can also mean uh, uh, only, but in this case, just, it can also mean uh, uh, like very like an intensifier, but in this case, just seems right. In other words, you don't create the mindfulness, you don't make it happen, you don't use willpower because mindfulness has already been established. Uh, yeah, you have this is what you have been doing before, that is what all the rest of the Buddhist path is about. So, mindfulness ha has already arisen. Now, you don't need to use any more willpower or force to give rise to mindfulness. Uh, yeah, you can just sit back, you can relax. Uh, and the breath is there. Uh, maybe not 100% of the time, you lose it a little bit, you think a little bit, but you come back to it very quickly again. Uh, and that means you are ready for the big time. Yeah? So this, what comes next is the big time. Uh, so this is where it really starts to get very interesting. Uh. So then we have the uh, uh, first tetrad. Uh, um, the breathing meditation, Anapanasati Sutta, is divided into 16 steps. Uh, and uh, uh, four steps in the groups of four. Four times four is 16. The each one is called a tetrad because it has four elements. So four tetrads. Uh, and each tetrad is equivalent to one of the Satipatthana practices. Uh, so the first one here, breathing in heavily to uh, stilling the body's motion. Uh, all of this is part of the body contemplation. It is equivalent to the Kaya Nupassana, the body contemplation in the Satipatthana Sutta. Yes, yeah, so I will go through this quickly before we get to the mind, uh, so we kind of get the full feeling for what is going on with the breath, with the um, Anapanasati. Uh. So breathing in heavily uh, or long, sometimes it's called long breath, uh, they know I am breathing in heavily. When breathing out heavily, they know uh, I'm breathing out heavily. Uh. When breathing in light, lightly, they know I'm breathing in lightly. When breathing out lightly, they know I'm breathing out lightly. Uh. 
They practice breathing, uh, breathing in, experiencing the whole body. Uh, they practice uh, breathing out, experiencing the whole body. They practice in breathing in, stilling the body's motion. Uh, they practice breathing out, stilling the body's motion. Uh, so this is how the breath meditation evolves uh, at the beginning. Uh, yeah. So when you start out, you are just mindful. Uh, and with each step here, uh, the breath changes with each step. And this is what you're seeing here. As you become calmer, as you uh, settle down, as your focus on the breath becomes better, this is the natural progression that happens with the breath meditation. Uh, the beginning, your breath is quite heavy, yeah? You're, you're not really kind of really solid yet. Uh, and as you gradually, as you, uh, as you become more peaceful, the breath becomes lighter because you don't need to breathe so heavily anymore because your need for oxygen goes down as well as you do this. Uh, yeah? So you uh, train in this way, as it says here. Uh, or actually, it says you know at the beginning here. You're just aware of what's going on. Uh, then you breathe lightly. Uh, then you're experiencing the whole body. And I'm not going into the, uh, the problems and what this means. This the Pali is Sabbakaya Patisang Vedi. Uh, uh, and um, uh, the meaning literally is experiencing the whole body. And the question then is, does that mean the breath, the, the breath as a body, or does it mean the physical body? And uh, to me, it's fairly obvious that it means the breath body because... Uh, it later on, the sutta says, well, the, the breath is called a body among bodies. So, you know, it's actually said specifically. So that's what I see, uh, understand it as, because this is, after all, breath meditation, not body meditation. But the point here is that your awareness expands. Yeah. First of all, you know the breath is going in. You know the breath is going out. Uh, then you train. Now we come to the training. Uh, it says here they practice this before it was knowing it. Uh, you practice, in other words, you keep on doing the meditation. And as you do that, your awareness expands. You're more present. Uh, you have more mindfulness. And mindfulness is improving here. Remember, mindfulness is not uh, something static. It's not as if you have given mindfulness, you have given rise to it, and then mindfulness stays the same. Uh, mindfulness is a dynamic thing, yeah. And it increases as you practice this. It becomes more clear. It becomes deeper, uh, even less thinking going on. Yeah, the brightness of the mind improves, uh, so the mindfulness gets stronger. Uh. And this, I think, is an important, very important idea, because sometimes people think that as long as you are mindful, then you will be able to have insight. Uh. But it's not mindfulness isn't just mindfulness. Mindfulness comes in large number of degrees, uh, and that all depends on the degree to which you have abandoned the hindrances entirely, the more completely they are abandoned, uh, the more clear would be your mindfulness. Uh, and also the opposite, the more it depends on to what extent you have developed all the good qualities of mind. Uh, if you have a lot of piti sukha, a lot of happiness and joy in your meditation, your mindfulness will be very powerful. Why? Because when you have piti sukha, you want to be here. You think, wow, this is so wonderful. Uh, why do I want to be? So I don't want to be anywhere else. I want to be just here. So it draws you into the present moment. Uh, one of the things that Abraham always says, you know, is the you make the present moment the pleasant moment. Uh, yeah, one of Ajahn Brahm's little catchphrases. Uh, he's very good with that, S but it's true. The more pleasant the present moment is, the more powerful will be your mindfulness because you want to. You don't want to be anywhere else. Uh, so you get drawn into the present moment, and as you do that, your awareness expands, uh, and you see the breath, and you see far more details than you used to. Uh, then. Uh, as you do that, you keep on with your awareness, the breath becomes calm. It says here, breathing in, stilling the body's motion. This is the Kaya Sankara uh, pas Pasambati or something like that. Uh, and the Kaya Sankara is usually the breath. Uh, so really, I think it should have said here, stilling the Kaya Sankara. Uh, yeah, I, I guess it's all right, the body's motion, but it means the breath in the suttas. Uh, so, uh, uh, so again, uh, the breath is the bodily motion at this point because that's all you are aware of. Uh, yes, you're stilling the breath. The breath starts to calm down. Uh, and remember, you're not doing anything here. The less you do, the more peaceful it becomes. You're just standing back. Uh, you're just aware. And as you have that awareness, uh, actually, it becomes peaceful all by itself. Uh, and this is what makes it such a pleasant process uh, because you don't have to do anything. Uh, 
yeah, all our lives we're always used to making things happen, to force things into existence. Uh, whenever you want to be successful at school or successful at work, uh, your parents tell you, work harder, work more, concentrate, yeah? Okay, okay, concentrate. And you really have to work really hard, and after a while you get really stressed out and burnt out uh, because you concentrate with force and with willpower. Uh. And then one day you realize actually real concentration doesn't come from willpower at all. It comes from enjoying what you're doing. Uh, and that is what meditation is. If you want to get really focused, uh, this is the only way to do it, is actually to let go of the willpower. Uh. So meditation is a completely different direction from what we're used to. Uh. It's almost the exact opposite. And this is what makes meditation difficult for people, yeah, because we are so used to using force and using willpower all the time, suddenly we're asked to do the opposite and you just can't do it uh, because you are so used to using your mind's will and volition to get things done. Suddenly, not doing it anymore actually turns out to be difficult. It is not really difficult, it's just unusual because you're not used to it. You have a habit of using willpower and suddenly you have to overturn it and it turns out to be hard. So this is why one of the reasons why meditation is so uh, special, so different from what you're used to, and why it is so delightful. And this is only the beginning here. The real delights really start from starts from here. Uh. So that is the uh, equivalent to the body contemplation. Now we come to the equivalence of the Vedana Nupassana, the contemplation of feelings. Uh. So the next four steps are equivalent to that. Uh. That that was a kind of kind of Vedana Nupasana, but uh, not not quite, uh, not the real thing. Just uh, anyway. <laughs> so the practice they practice breathing in, experiencing rapture. This is piti. They practice breathing out, experiencing rapture. Uh, they practice breathing in, experiencing bliss. This is sukha. They practice out, experiencing bliss. Uh, they practice breathing in, experiencing these emotions. Uh, they practice breathing out, experiencing these emotions. Uh, they practice breathing in, stilling these emotions. Uh, they practice breathing out, stilling these emotions. Uh, so here we are moving on. Remember, each step here is a development on the previous one. Uh, it is not that we're not doing anything radically different here than we just did before. Uh, each step is a development from the previous one. So you just stay on with the breath. Uh, and as you stay on with the breath, uh, you start sometimes to experience joy. Yeah, rapture here is like joy. It's like this beautiful feeling inside. We feel life becomes really worth living, life becomes joyous, life becomes happy. Sometimes you feel it as a physical feeling going through your body and all of these kind of things. Uh, and it happens as a natural consequence of allowing the breath to become very peaceful. Uh. Sometimes it doesn't work, sometimes you may become peaceful, it doesn't give rise to any rapture and joy. Sometimes you have it to give it a little bit of help. And this is why the Buddha sometimes talks about meditation practice, it talks about the various ways of contemplating, yeah? he ta or recollecting. He talks about the Buddha Nusati, the Chaga Nusati, the Sila Nusati, Anusati means recollection. Chaga is generosity. Sila is your habits or your virtue or your character. So you recall something positive in your life that you have done before. You bring that into your meditation. And when you bring it in, often you can experience some joy because of whatever you have done before. Uh, again, this shows you the importance and how Sila, right, how, how it kind of uh, weaves in to your meditation practice and becomes part of it. Uh, because when you have that sila, it is natural to feel good about yourself. Yeah, the better you are as a person, the more good things you do in life, the more kindly you speak to other people, all of these things. Uh, sometimes you just feel, we, I'm a good person. I live well. Not like an ego way, yeah, but just a kind of quiet feeling inside of yourself, knowing that you're doing living, living in the right way. Uh. And this is what this is about. Uh. You have this peaceful sense of knowing that you're living well, that you are a good person. That's what's happening here. Uh. And then as you keep on uh, developing this, this feeling becomes more and more profound. Uh, yeah? It calms down, and with the calming down, there's a more delightful experience of happiness. Here they call it bliss. Uh, this is the sukkha. 
This is the beautiful thing about meditation practice. You go from one experience of bliss uh, to a better experience of bliss. Uh, you probably didn't know there were so many different types of bliss, uh, but uh, actually there's all these degrees of bliss, one better than the other one. Uh, and this is what is happening here. Uh. So you go to that place, and then you practice breathing in and out, uh, experiencing these emotions. That's the next one. Uh, and uh, uh, this is a slightly controversial translation here by Bhante Sujato. Uh, this is, um, what is the Pali here again? This is the, um, um, ah, okay, well I can't remember the Pali now. That's a bit silly. So let's have a look at the Sanka. Uh, not sank chitta, chit not chitta sankara. Um, what is it? Uh, something with sankara. I think you're right, but wi what what exactly is it? Uh, uh, okay, so it is chitta sankara. Okay, that's what I okay, that's what I had. So that's correct. Uh, so okay, so there you are. So experiencing these emotions, chitta sankara, pati sangvedi, uh, and. Um, Yeah, so sankara again. These sankara is um, chitta sankara is the uh, usually defined in the suttas as feelings and perceptions. Uh, so in other words, whatever is happening in your experience is what this means. Uh, so you just experience more of the same kind of feelings. Yeah, moving forward, the more you exp experience of them, uh, the more peaceful and delightful everything is. Uh, and then you have the you practice breathing out, stilling these emotions. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then uh, that is the next one. So you make it even more peaceful. Uh. And so what you see here, that meditation practice, when it works in the right way, there's two kinds of things that are developing together. One is the bliss is becoming more and more profound and beautiful. Uh, and the other one is the peace is becoming more and more profound and still. Uh. These are the two things. And this is how you can judge your meditation practice, whether it's heading in the right direction or not, whether the bliss is becoming better, and the peace is becoming better. Those two things together are kind of the signposts of good meditation practice. So. Okay. So, coming on to the next one. Go away. Okay. <laughs> okay, so that is the uh, Vedana Nupasana. And now we come to the Chitta Nupasana, the contemplation of mind which this is supposed to be all about, uh, yeah? So now we come to this, and it's interesting. This gives you an idea of how far down in terms of development of meditation the citta nupassana actually is. It's a very profound state of meditation practice already, uh, yeah? And this is where this really uh, happens. Uh. So they practice breathing in, experiencing the mind. They practice breathing out, experiencing the mind. Uh. They practice breathing in, gladdening the mind. Practice out, breathing out, gladdening the mind. Uh, they practice breathing in and out, immersing the mind in samadhi. They practice breathing in and out, freeing the mind or liberating the mind is the last one here. So this is the citta nupasana, and this is uh, quite different from what we read before. Uh, when we were reading before, it had, had all about knowing the mind with and without desire, knowing the mind with and without ill will, how does this relate to that? Uh, and this is kind of where it gets interesting, because here, this is the practical way of understanding that citta nupasana, which before seemed a little bit uh, theoretical. Uh. So what does it mean to experience the mind? And uh, what it means is that to be able to know what the mind is, uh, you have to abandon those things that are not mind. Uh, you have to kind of isolate isolate the mind from other things. Uh, and when you isolate the mind from other things, uh, that is when you start to understand what mind is. Uh. How do you isolate the mind? The way you do that, as uh, the breath and everything calms down, uh, the whole body, the five senses disappear. Yeah, They start to fade away. There's nothing really left of the five senses. They are still there. They're still operating, but very weakly and in the background. Uh, and now the mind comes into the focus instead. Uh. And one of the characteristics of the mind coming into the focus uh, is this thing known as the 
nimitta, yeah, samadhi nimitta, when you get a bright light or something beautiful happening in your meditation practice, uh, this is one of the characteristics of the ordinary world fading away and the mental world coming into focus instead. Uh. So at this point, you start to get these things called the nimittas. You start to see lights in a meditation and these kind of things. Uh, and uh, if you look at the sequence here, you have just been going through all that bliss. Yeah? So when you come to the mind state here, it's going to be very, very blissful. Uh. Yeah, just really incredibly enjoyable at this particular point. And you start to realize uh, how profound meditation is uh, when you get here. Uh. You start to realize that actually there's more meaning in this kind of experience uh, than there is in almost everything else you ever had in your entire life. Uh. Suddenly you feel, wow, this is it. Uh, yeah, now I'm experiencing a little bit of the meaning of life almost directly and personally as you get to this particular point. Uh. And but that isn't the end of it, yeah. Then you experience things. Uh, you want to kind of work. You want to do something with that nimitta, that light that you see. Uh, and what you want to do with it, you want to practice in gladdening that mind, uh, making it even more happy. Uh, as if it isn't happy enough, you want to kind of make it even more happy. Uh, yeah. And then so you you do that. How do you do that? By staying with the the breath will still be there in the background. Now you can either focus probably more on the nimitta than the breath. Uh, so you focus on the light, and as you do that, it becomes even more happy. It shines up. It becomes even more bright. Uh, then uh, you make it even more still. Yeah, I said the two factors that makes you know something is good meditation is more stillness, more peace, more happiness. So you make it more still. Samadhi becomes even stronger. You're even more focused on this light, even less distractions in any way. Uh, yeah, this is the samadhi happening here. And then if you keep on doing this, uh, gladdening that mind, making it more still, there comes a point when the mind is freed uh, or you are freeing the mind. And freeing the mind is the final release from the five senses, the final release from the body, the final release from all hindrances uh, and defilements of the mind. Uh. Yeah, this is what this is about. This is the uh, contemplation of the mind. Uh. So it's pretty good news, isn't it? Uh, it? Before, I don't know what you felt when you were reading the uh, Satipatthana Sutta. It sounded very dry. It didn't sound all that interesting. Okay, yeah, the kind of the mind with greed, the mind without greed, the mind with illusion, the mind without illusion, the contracted mind, the uncontracted mind. Uh, it doesn't sound all that exciting, does it? It sounds kind of, okay, uh, whatever, uh, I'm not sure what to do. This is what it actually means. Uh, yeah. So here you have the kind of practical application of this this is what it means. Uh. So how can you understand all of these things uh, on the basis of this kind of practice? Uh. And this is actually what happens next in this particular sutta, what comes after this. Uh. So after you have gone through all of these things, uh, you have freed the mind through a deep state of samadhi, like a jhana state or something, the very last thing you do here is freeing the mind. Yeah, after you have been freeing the mind, you enter jhana, you have then moved from satipatthana to samma, samadhi instead at that particular point. This is the last thing you do in satipatthana before you enter samma, samadhi. Yeah. So what happens then? And what happens then is that this is the next part. And this is, where this is equivalent to the dhamma nupassana. So the dhamma nupassana, let's have a quick look at it uh, down here. Yeah, you practice breathing in, observing impermanence, uh, observing fading away. Uh, you practice in and out, observing cessation. You practice in and out, observing letting go. Uh, these are four very uh, important words in the Pali language. Impermanence being here anicca, fading away being viraga, cessation being niroda, letting go being pati nisaga. So this is what you do, and this at this particular point, what you're doing is you're trying to reflect uh, on the experience. That's why it says breathing in, observing these things. Yeah, It is like uh, anu, anupassi, it's like you're reflecting back on the experiences you have already had. Uh. Yeah, What are you observing? And what you're observing is the things that you have already seen. You're thinking back on what you have already seen in your meditation practice. Uh. And this is what I meant before when I was saying, you take in all the data, you take in all the information 
as the mind becomes more happy and still and peaceful, uh, and once all the data have been taken in, then uh, you observe back and you look at that, that data in terms of these four qualities. Uh, yeah. So how does that work? Well, in practice, because we're now dealing with the citta nupasana, so for example, here you, the first one of the citta nupasana is experiencing the mind. Yeah. So what you are what you are seeing here is that the body and the five senses are becoming very weak. Yeah, they are disappearing in the background. So you are seeing the impermanence, you are seeing the fading away of the body and the five senses. When you come all the way down to freeing the mind down here, then you see the cessation of the body and the five senses. So you see the gradual kind of disappearance of certain things. But what you also see is that you see the mind becoming brighter and brighter, and for the first time in your life, do you really does it become clear what it means to have a mind without defilements? Uh, yeah, because at this point there is no greed anymore, uh, there is no desire, there is no ill will. All of those five hindrances are completely gone. But uh, uh, and for the first time, because they are gone or coming very very close to being gone, as you go through these particular points, uh, you can also understand what they are. Sometimes your understanding of what greed and desire is only happens when you have let go of it. It's like the, f you know, the famous tadpole becoming a frog, uh, getting out of the water. You only understand what water is uh, when you come out of it. Uh. So this is what it is here. Once the mind becomes so pure, only then can you understand uh, the defilements and the opposites. Uh. So what you are seeing here now, you are reflecting on these things. Uh, you are understanding the defilements, what they are, as you observe anicca, viraga, and niroda, uh, cessation, fading away, fading away and cessation, you also understand the causality behind this. This is part of the observation, is understanding the causality. Why do the defilements arise? Uh, how do they cease? Yeah? Because you have seen the process, uh, you now know, you understand what brings about the cessation of these defilements, etc., etc. Uh. So this is what happens at this particular point. Uh, you gather the data through watching the mind and then afterwards uh, you then apply your observation and you apply your thinking mind to actually understand the process and what is going on. Uh. So this is the uh, citta nupasana. And uh, you take this to a very high level so you understand all of these qualities including the liberation of the mind, the samadhi and all of these things. Uh, and as you do so, you become a master of meditation. Uh, this is the idea. So uh, if you're not there yet, you are heading in that direction, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I always love to listen to Ajahn Brahm when he talks about meditation practice. He often gives some very nice talks during the rains retreat. Uh, and he says, oh yeah, meditation is so easy. Yeah, you just sit down, you close your eyes, the nimitta bang comes up and boof, you kind of go into deep states of samadhi. So this is like mastery of meditation. Huh? <laughs> or uh, so I visited uh, Lumpu Ganha, a fam very famous monk in Thailand recently. Huh? And he said, oh yeah, you just meditate a little bit and you kind of just relax yeah, and everything is fine. Uh, and the rest of the day you just do services. And he's kind of bright, like a light all the time. Really, really bright person. And you know that his meditation must be really incredibly powerful, but he only sits, you know, he doesn't sit all that much because he just probably just goes in, bang, into samadhi, and then he kind of comes out. Uh, and then he looks... <laughs> <laughs> it's very, uh, very, very beautiful when you see that. It kind of gives you this sense that the Dhamma is alive. Yeah? When you see these people, it's like, whoa, these people, they really have the act together. And Ajahn Gandha, very powerful kind of energy about it, very beautiful energy, very kind, very gentle, but very, very powerful. It's like you're not really sure whether to be afraid or not. You kind of, oh. <laughs> kind of <laughs> so very, very nice. So this is the outcome of uh, all of this. Yeah, this is actually where all of this comes. And then uh, just to add a little bit more there on the very end about the observing impermanence fading away, cessation and letting go. Uh, uh, just to give you a little bit more of feeling for what that all is about. Uh, and uh, what that really is about, it is observing the process you have been going through. What is that process? Well, that process is a lot of things 
gradually fading away, yeah? The body disappearing, the five senses disappearing, the uh, uh, hindrances uh, gradually fading away and disappearing. Uh, uh, certain perceptions, almost all perceptions of the mind are gradually fading away. Everything becomes simpler and simpler. First of all, the breath becoming simpler, then the nimitta, more and more, more, and more simplified until there's almost nothing left but bliss. Uh, then there is the feelings, yeah, certain feelings disappearing, all the painful feelings going, all that is left is just supreme happiness, and then the happiness also transforming into more and more delightful happiness. Uh, then there is the will, which is kind of fading away more and more as it becomes more and more simple, uh, less and less is going on. Your mind is really, really still. When you enter samadhi, it is absolutely still towards the end. Uh, now, if you think back on the things I've just been talking about, talking about the body, feeling, perceptions, and the will. What is that? Tripkandas. So what you are seeing here, you're actually seeing the gradual impermanence or the gradual fading away of the five kandas. This is what you're seeing. People very often ask, what does it mean to contemplate the five kandas? This is what it means. As you see this, you see their impermanence, you see their fading away, you see their cessation. Uh, and this is how you come to understand their impermanence, how you actually reach awakening as a consequence. Uh, it's a very important point because it's not obvious. Sometimes in the suttas it just says, oh yeah, you think about the five, uh, you reflect on the five khandhas. Uh, this is how it happens. Uh, and uh, as you do this, uh, yeah, uh, as you uh, practice in this way, you fulfill all the four satipatthanas. Uh, this is all you have to do, uh, watching your little breath, uh, yeah, or whatever it is. Uh, <laughs> and uh, as you do so, you go all gradually, it takes you all the way to awakening. It's not very complicated, yeah? It is very simple in a certain way. It's simple, it's just that it takes a lot of commitment and perseverance to do it. Anybody can do this. It uh, doesn't matter how young or how old you are. Well, it's good to be at least five years old, I suppose. But, you know, <laughs> it's, you don't have to be anyone special to be able to do this. Uh, uh, in the suttas, there is the youngest arahant in the suttas was uh, Dabba Malaputta, seven years old. Uh, yeah? So that's really, that's probably maybe the minimum requirement for being an arahant, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so... Not nothing very kind of hard about this, uh, and just very kind of straightforward if you understand what you have to have to do. Uh. So what is that you have to do? Uh? How do you get to this particular point? Uh, yeah, how do we uh, enable ourselves to actually be able to experience the breath in this way? Uh? Is there anyone who wouldn't like to do this? Uh? Is anyone who thinks this sounds scary or bad or no good or does everyone think this is kind of cool? Uh? It's pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, it, is, it is one of the most extraordinarily and interesting journeys that anyone can take in this life because it is a journey towards real happiness, towards real contentment, towards real finding real meaning in your life. As you move towards these things, it actually feels that you are touching the meaning of life itself. This is what is so powerful about this. Why is that the case? Well, because as you do this, your desires are fading away, you're becoming content and happy and all of these kind of things. Uh, and that fading away of the desires means that you don't want to do anything else. Uh, and that by its very definition is a sense of meaning when you don't want to do anything else. Uh, it is always when we want to go somewhere else, you want to attain something else, uh, that we haven't found meaning because precisely because we want to go somewhere else. Uh, but if you don't want to go any anywhere else, by definition, you have found meaning. You found something powerful. The better your samadhi is, uh, the more meaning you have. Uh. So how do we get there? And how to get there, just uh, very briefly, got a few minutes left. Uh, uh, just how to get there is all the very simple things in life, all the basic things that you do in your daily life, uh, how you treat other people, how you speak to other people, uh, your ability to just be generous and caring at all times, uh, your ability not, not to allow yourself to be upset and angry too easily just because other people do things that are not so nice, yeah? There's always going to be people in the world who do things that are not really nice, uh, but you don't have to react to that. Uh, you don't have to do that, you know, do anything wrong in return. Uh. And uh, this is where uh, one of the differences on this path comes about. Sometimes uh, 
you will hear, I remember I had a discussion this with a Burmese, very famous Burmese monk many years ago, and uh, he said he does chitta nupassana, this is kind of his main practice. Uh, and he said, well, uh, the way he does that is that he always is aware of his mind, regardless of what he does. Yeah, he tra he whenever he does anything, he's always aware of his mind. So I said, well, how exactly do we distinguish between chitta nupassana and sense restraint, the indriya sangvara sila? This is the nice thing, even though he's Burmese, we can t use a few Pali words and we know understand each other straight away. This is kind of the, actually he speaks a bit of English as well. But th so the Pali word creates a common understanding, which is very handy here. So I asked him, how, what is the difference? Because Indriya Sangvara Sila, the re uh, restraint of the faculties, is precisely about keeping your mind even, not allowing it to tip over into ill will or too much desire. And he wasn't really able to give me a very good answer to that, yeah, which was kind of interesting. And the reason, I think, why he wasn't able to give a good answer was because Chitta Nupassana has come to mean very often, all the Satipatthanas have come to mean, especially within Burmese Buddhism, the idea that you do things in daily life, you do things all the time, because Sampajanya is part of the Satipatthana Sutta. But if you take that out, suddenly it becomes quite different. Uh, and if you take it out, instead of thinking of uh, uh, chitta nupassana as something you do in daily life, it is indriya sangvara sila, that is what you do in daily life. And it's a bit different. Uh, you don't have to be mindful all the time. What you have to do is you have to be mindful enough uh, to be able to know what is going on in your mind. Uh, so try that in your life. Yeah, Try to have a enough mindfulness, uh, don't doesn't have to be the super mindfulness of Satipatthana where you kind of watch your breath continuously, but enough mindfulness in your life to know what is happening in your mind. Uh, yeah, am I about to get angry? Uh, am I, is this person uh, uh, about to kind of, you know, uh, create ill will in me? Am I about to be dissatisfied with something? Uh, and if you can see that much, if you're able to be aware of what is happening in your mind, in your mind then you can take a countermeasure to stop the ill will from arising here. And what is that countermeasure? Because this is where the very important part of the, of the practice comes from. And this is a part of the practice that everyone uh, can do. Everyone here can do this. Uh, the way to never get angry uh, is always to remind yourself that people in your life, whoever that, whoever that you meet in your life at any time, uh, the reason why the way they are the way they are uh, is because of habit, uh, is because of conditioning, uh, is because of the past programming of their mind through past lives, uh, through their upbringing in this life, whatever it is. Uh, and very often they just act out that inner conditioning that is so deeply rooted in them. Uh. I think that almost everyone in this world really wants to be kind. Yeah, Everyone wants to do the right thing. And the reason is because we all know that if you treat other people well, you feel good about yourself. Yeah, It's almost intuitive. You, kn you know that if you're kind to others, you just feel good about yourself. If you are a bit nasty to others, you actually feel bad about yourself as a consequence. So we all know that kindness is right. We know kindness works. And yet, Sometimes we're not able to do it. And the reason we can't do it is because of conditioning here. If you look at yourself, you will see that sometimes, no matter how hard you try, you just can't do the right thing here because the co conditioning is much stronger than you are. Here. That's why it happens. Uh. So understand uh, the idea that people are conditioned. Uh. Understand when anyone does something silly or stupid, uh, they are the one who have a problem. Uh. They have a problem because actually they probably want to do the right thing but they can't stop themselves from doing the bad thing. Uh, yeah, they are trapped in a mind state. Uh, they are trapped in a certain way of looking at the world, uh, whereby they are compelled to do something stupid, uh, creating suffering for themselves, even though everybody wants to be happy. Uh. And when you realize that people are actually creating suffering for themselves, even though they want to be happy, uh, what happens then? You have compassion for them. Uh, yeah, that's the only natural response. You are creating suffering for yourself. You don't don't say that to them, but you are, you know, uh, <laughs> you are. <laughs> you don't you understand? Uh, if they are already upset and angry, don't say that because it's going to make it worse. But you know that's what they are. So this is what you think. Uh, don't take it personally because it never is personal. It's nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with them. Uh. 
So this is how you turn around your mind. Uh, these are very powerful teachings. Then this comes from the Buddhist idea of non-self, that we're not really in charge of ourselves. Yeah, we are so heavily conditioned. Uh, and uh, once you get these things, you can start to forgive others. Uh, you can have compassion for them, almost regardless of what they do. Uh, and there's no one in this whole, wor whole world you can't forgive uh, and you can't let go of their actions uh, because you understand this basic principle of the Dhamma. So this is where you need to put in the effort. Uh, on top of that, uh, yeah, this is the basic thing. If you can do that much, actually it is quite challenging already to do that, to never get angry, upset with anyone, but if you can lean in that direction, move towards that, uh, then it will have a very powerful impact on your meditation practice. Uh, you get less upset in the world. You have more compassion and kindness for the people around you. You're building down, you're reducing the bad qualities. Uh, at the same time as you do that, uh, you act with kindness. Uh, you treat people well. Uh, you say kind words. Uh, you take every opportunity to say something, to do an act of generosity through your speech. Uh, yeah, remember that speech is so powerful. And as you use your speech in the right way, you take every opportunity to make that an act of generosity and kindness. Uh, whenever you have... Uh, one second, I'll get back to you. Yeah. Uh, and then when you take every opportunity like that, to be kind, to be generous, to say the right thing, uh, and the reason why you do that is because you understand that this path is so beautiful, uh, it is so powerful, it has the opportunity to literally change your life and give you everything you ever wanted. Uh, and instead of looking for happiness in worldly things that would always let you down at the end of the day, uh, will always be problematic, uh, Relationships, sometimes relationships can be, very can be nice, yeah? But in the end, they're going to let you down. In the end, uh, people are going to leave you, they're going to die, they're going to get sick, whatever. This is just the reality of things. Uh, it can't be any different from that. And once we focus on those things that really have the, uh, the chance to make a difference for us, that is our inner life, because we can control our inner life to some extent, uh, then you make so much progress on this path. Uh. So bring up that right view, uh, Remind yourself of what really matters in this world and this life. Uh, and as you do that, your virtue, your kindness, your generosity, your way of thinking, all of that will gradually come into line. Uh, and then you will be li living for the benefit of yourself and also for the benefit of other people. You become a blessing to the world. Uh, and uh, what a wonderful thing that is. Uh. But, uh, please, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what you what you do is that um, usually they you will find that there are certain people in your life that you find difficult. Yeah, I think everybody has that. There are certain people that get on your nerves more easily than others. These kind of things. Uh, yeah, uh, this is just the way things seem to be because of different personalities or, or what have you. Uh, so what you the first thing to do if that is the case is to not wait till you are around that person uh, to think uh, to think about that person differently do it in your private time yeah when you're doing your meditation or when you're just doing some walking back and forth or whatever and then there's two things you can do either you remind yourself of the good qualities in that person uh, yeah there are a lot of people that might irritate us but actually have a lot of good qualities uh, so people who are members of the buddhist fellowship yeah uh, Mon irritating monks, yeah, <laughs> or whatever, yeah. I mean, everyone can be irritating sometimes. So you stand back and then you think about the good qualities. Uh, and when you think about those good qualities, you build that up and you think, why am I allowing myself to get irritated over small little things uh, when the big picture is so beautiful? Uh, these are people who are trying really hard, who are intending in the right way, yeah. So you remember the big picture, and then you can let go of the small things. So build that up in your own private time. Uh, sometimes you can't do that. Uh, and if you can't do that, uh, because maybe the person has too many bad qualities or whatever, you can't really see the good, that is a time to have compassion. Like I mentioned before, the person is trapped in these things. yeah. And so, But again, build it up in your private time. I should have compassion for this person. They are like a sick person. That's what it says in the suttas. They're like a sick person, yeah? They are heading towards their own demise, death, and they're going to have really bad consequences in the future if they carry on like that. Uh, so here is someone who doesn't understand what is beneficial for themselves. Uh, the more you reflect on that, uh, 
the more compassion and kindness you will be able to have. And then one day when you meet them, suddenly you don't get angry anymore. Yeah. It's not going to happen straight away. It's going to take time. But eventually one day you will have turned around so much. Uh, and that is kind of the really a powerful moment because you understand how conditioned your mind is and how it can be reconditioned. Uh, this person used to upset you. They don't upset you anymore. It's like a victory in your spiritual practice when these things happen. Uh, <laughs> that's exactly right. Yeah, so that is uh, that is what you basically how you go about this. Uh, yeah. Okay, let's have another break. So uh, and uh, another maybe, I think on the schedule it says forty-five minutes or thereabouts. Uh, so we'll see you back in here again at uh, quarter to five, uh, and then we can have a bit more of a dhamma discussion and Q and A or whatever else uh, at at that point. Uh, okay. <coughs>